Welcome back to the third part of my discussion on Islamic monotheism with the intent of discussing Islam's ties to Ethiopia as a introductory and minor portion for now and its major association with Yemen and Yemen's association with Babylonian paganism, most especially moon worship. Let's start with Islamic symbolism. Let's have a look at the pagan crescent moon. The Islamic crescent moon is called the Hilal. The Hilal means crescent. It is Islam's symbol. Now, very briefly, I'll introduce this and I will come to this idea as we go through. The cross is important in Christianity, both historically and, of course, religiously. Therefore, it is safe to assume that the crescent and the star are important in Islam, both historically and religiously. I mean, they could have chosen Donald Duck as their mascot. They could have chosen a piece of coal. They could have chosen a tree. They chose the crescent and the star because those are important. It should be known that Hilal is the name of an Arabian pagan moon god. Let's start with this, the Arab League. Let's look at a number of the flags in the Arab League. Crescent and star, crescent and star, horizontal versus the vertical. Star, crescent and star in Tunisia. Morocco, hmm, pentagram. Kind of wonder what's going on with that. Jordan, star. Comoros, crescent, star. Very, very interesting. So lots of crescents and stars. Now, this is the pentagram on the... <laughs> this is the pentagram on the Moroccan flag. Now, the pentagram is Babylonian. It is pagan. It is the symbol of the gods Ishtar and Marduk. Right? Those are both, well, Babylonian pagan gods. Now, the red color is from the Imams of Yemen. This is some confirmation of the association with Yemen. And the pentagram is also said to be the seal of Solomon. Of course, in Islam, because of Solomon's association with the Queen of Sheba, they assume that he was a pagan himself. There's this. We'll get into that as we go. This is a copy of a pentagram I just downloaded off the internet. I just looked up satanic pentagram or witch's pentagram. And well, yeah, they're rather similar. So Morocco's got some... some some answers to give as to why they've chosen the occult pentagram as their yeah, symbol on their flag. So the Hilal, back to that. Now the Egyptian hieroglyph for month features a crescent above a star. Now this is a remnant of a lunar calendar. Now the symbol has spiritual significance in ancient Mesopotamia. The Babylonian cuneiform word shiptu means incantation. Right, so could the crescent of star have relationship to occult magical practices, incantation? Well, there's certainly hints of that. Now, this originally took a form very similar to the modern star and crescent. Let's have a look at the earliest hieroglyph. Now we have 1300 BC. We have, I uh, can't read that date right now, and 600 BC. So 4300 BC, my bad, 2800 BC and 600 BC. Crescents and stars. And... Apparently, this symbol is used to ward off evil, to ward off the evil eye, which is an occult practice. Now, this boundary stone on the right here, this is the stone of King Nebuchadnezzar I from Babylon, who reigned 1125 to 1104 BC. And it contains, as you can see here, a star within a crescent. Very, very familiar. Nebuchadnezzar, star and crescent. Islam borrows the star and the crescent. The symbols were associated with the deities Sin, or Shin, the moon, no, let me just move myself over. So the symbols are associated with Shin, the moon, and Ishtar, Venus. Venus, of course, is the morning star. And you've got Shin, the Babylonian moon god. Shin was also the national deity of, well, Southern Arabia, Yemen. So let's continue. The Hilal Crescent is commonly found on all of these ancient pagan coins. So the symbol is found in the Parthian Empire. Parthia, this would be what we would call Iran today. On the coins of Phaetus V, from 2 BC to 4 AD, the star represented either the Zoroastrian divinity Mitra or the divinity Tishtra. The star and crescent became an emblem of the Parthian kings and was adopted by the rulers of the Sasanian Empire. In the Sasanian period, the star and crescent is shown with explicitly Zoroastrian elements. Coins display a portrait of the king surrounded by the symbol. So you've got the king surrounded by the symbol. You can see there, crescent, 
crescent here, right? And you'll see here the fire symbol, the fire altar, right? On the reverse, you've got a depiction of a fire altar with attendants. And when Muslim Arabs conquered Persia in the seventh century, the Sasanian coin designs were preserved. The reformer's caliph, Abd al-Malik, right, from 685 to 705 AD, replaced the fire altar scene with Arabic text, but he kept the stars and the crescents. The symbol later appears in Muslim art. I do want to note, Abd al-Malik is not a name, it is a title. So it's like Caesar, Caesar Augustus, they would have, Caesar would have a name, right? Julius Caesar, if you say Caesar, it could be one of many. Abd al-Malik, the term Abd, the slave of the Malik, the slave of the king. The king, in this case, the Malik, in this case, is slave of the god, right? The primary deity. So you could have Abdul Malik James, Abdul Malik Sally, Abdul Malik Michael, Abdul Malik Marwan. There should be a name attached to that. So Abdul Malik here, this one, this again is a title. It is not a name. We need to establish who that particular Malik was. But the term Malik is derived from an earlier Yemeni term, the Muqarabs. Right. We'll get into that as we go. So the crescent, Muslims often explain it away as saying, well, that the Ottomans did it, you know, and that happened in the 1700s and the 1740s. Well, is that true? So is it Ottoman or is it pagan? Let's have a look here. You'll see a number of these coins from that region, right? Crescent and star, crescent and star, crescent and star, crescent and star. These are all from Haran in Turkey. Then you can see Baal Haddad, right? Mm, Baal. Well, there we go, crescent and either moon or sun symbol, crescent and disc. And then a pagan Byzantine coin, hmm, crescent and star, and then Hittite crescent moon from the pagans, crescent and oof, moon or star, uh, moon. Right, now Muslims argue that this crescent is the popularized symbol of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. However, we can see that this symbol goes back into BC, right well before islam was established and they've borrowed this pagan symbol which has a long history in that region others state that it is a pre-islamic deity and moon god religious symbols are historically and theologically significant the cross is linked to the crucifixion of christ it is therefore logical that the crescent moon has a historical and theological meaning for islam islam claims to be the original the true monotheistic religion of abraham of course this is their corrupted version of abraham now I need to introduce the word Hanif. The plural is Hunafa. In Islamic writings, this is one who follows the original and true monotheistic religion. In the Quran, Hanif is used especially of Abraham. Abraham is Hanif. Even Allah is Hanifan, right? Allah. This is the religion of Allah. And Islamic usage occasionally uses Hanif as the equivalent of a Muslim. A Muslim is Hanif. Now, they're playing a little bit of a word game here. They don't mean the practices of Islam as we know it today. They're saying he submitted to God. Great. So, assuming a Buddhist submits to his god, then he's Hanif too. But it's got nothing to do with Islam. But they're trying to imply that because Abraham submitted to God, therefore that makes him a Muslim. Christians submit to Jesus. Christians submit to God too. Does that make them Muslims? No. That is merely wordplay on their part. But the Hanafiya is the religion of Abraham or Islam. So they're saying that God is Muslim, right? Allah is Muslim. Adam is Muslim, David was Muslim, everybody was Muslim. So, yeah, this is simply the claim that they're making. Now, Hanif in Arabic is a masculine name, meaning righteous person or true believer. It is generally agreed. Hanif is derived from the Syriac word Hanpe, which means heathen or pagan. So these Muslims were called heathens and pagans by the Christians and by the Jews. And they adopted the name. They said, yes, well, we are the pagans. They simply took this name that was given to them. Remember the term Christian was a derogatory term given to the Christians originally, the followers of Christ, right? The Christians. And Christians said, well, you know, if the shoe fits, we'll wear it. And by the same token, but don't forget the early Christians and the Jews recognized, they absolutely recognized that these early practices, these early Islamic practices were pagan practices. And they rejected them as not part of what is biblical. And the Muslims adopted the term. Muslims claim that Muhammad's religion goes back before Judaism and before Christianity, before the Christians and the Jews went astray. This is before the laws of Moses. But we also know that before the laws of Moses, there were the seven laws of Noah, 
Now, of course, there's a lot of controversy, but look at my videos on the seven laws of Noah. Please do a search for the discussions on the seven laws of Noah I have in my channel. Um, I would avoid the propaganda that uninformed people are providing. I go into extreme depth on what the seven laws of Noah are. These are precursor to the Ten Commandments. Five of the seven laws of Noah are verbatim in the Ten Commandments. So if the seven laws of Noah are the epitome of satanic evil, then we have to consider that the Ten Commandments, by that logic given by these uninformed people, this makes the Ten Commandments 50% satanic evil, which would be, uh, I think the technical word is stupid. So, moving on. Hanifan. Now, they claim it means uprightness in the Qur'an. It's translated as uprightness. This is a false translation. It means pagan. We know it comes from the Syriac Hante, right? So, be steadfast in faith in all uprightness and do not be one of the polytheists. This is Qur'an 105, 10, 105. Be steadfast in uprightness, right? Be Hanifan, right? Allah is Hanifan. Therefore, Allah is a pagan god. According to the definition of the early Christians and the early Jews, they are pagans. This is translated as upright, it is Hanifan, right? Now, upright actually refers to upright pillars. If we go through the Bible and we look at the injunction that Abraham was given was do not worship upright stone pillars because this is paganism. What did we see in the beginning in the very first episode? We saw this worship of upright stone pillars as part of the pagan moon worship of al Makkah. Be steadfast in faith in all uprightness, right? So again, they insist that this is all to do with uprightness, being upright as in being honorable, being an upstanding human being. Uprightness literally means upright pillars. Show your uprightness like the pillars that were worshipped. Abraham was originally... Now, if they're going to the religion before Abraham, right, before Abraham became Jewish, which they say is a corruption of the story, then Abraham was a Sabaean. According to Jewish sources, Abraham was a Sabaean moon worshipper, like those in Yemen. Abraham worshipped stone pillars, upright stone pillars. Hanif. Non-Islamic sources. Let's see what they say. In Jewish Midrashic literature, the Hebrew root A-N-F is associated with heretics, the Menim. And in Syriac documents, Hanpa, plural Hanpe, denotes non-Christian pagans. So they were pagans. This complicates the etymology of the Quranic Hanif. By Quranic, I mean Quranic. However, understand that the Quran, K-L-O-R-E-N, is the holy book of the KKK. Guess where the KKK got the name of their holy book from? Yeah. Which retains the sense of one disassociated from Judaism and Christianity to the pure religion of Abraham. Before Abraham followed God Yahweh, Abraham was a pagan, a Sabaean pagan, a worship of upright idols right so therefore this is the pure religion which is a pagan religion the religion of abraham and the religion of abraham's family was the paganism of the sabaeans babylonian moon worship christian apologists of the early abbasid period retained the pagan sense of the term and applied it to muslims in an attempt to demonstrate the derogatory aspect of the title hanif by which muslims called themselves that's in griffith the prophet pages 118 to 9 and the pagan sense of the term was known to Muslim writers who applied the title Hunafa to such pagans as the Sabiyun, e.g. Masudi. Now the Sabiyun, there's a little bit of confusion within the Islamic sources. Do they mean the Sabaeans or the Sabians? The Sabians are these Gnostics, these occult Gnostics from Haran in Turkey. We just saw the coins in Haran in Turkey with the crescent and the moon. But there's more to Haran and we will discuss that as we go. But very often it's shortcut to the Sabi, S-A-B-I, and we're not sure exactly who that means, although it could be potentially that Muhammad was first a Sabaean, right, Yemeni Sabaean, and then became a Sabian, which are these Gnostic heretics who've taken portions of Christianity, corrupted it, and incorporated it into their own religion. We will come to more on that later. Okay, uh, in this case, Sabians. So, Sabiun, the Sabians. Al-Yakubi describes as Hanifs, the pagans who worship the stars in Saul and David's times. Interesting. So now they've taken on the name Hanifs, and these are people who are star worshippers, and the star worshippers, this is astrological worship, sun, star, and moon. The stars are the children of the union of the moon and the sun. So the moon and the sun have children, and those children are the stars. So, yeah, those are the Hanifs. And Muslims call themselves Hanif. They are the original Hanifan. They worship the original Hanifan religion, which 
within the historical context, especially within the biblical historical context, are pagans who worshipped the sun, the stars, and the moon. So now, the word Hanif in the Quran. Hanif is used of Abraham as pure worship of Allah, contrasted with idolaters, the Mushrikun. Again, Abraham was a pagan, a moon-worshipping pagan, prior to becoming a follower of Yahweh and basically founding Judaism. It asserts that Abraham was neither Jew nor Christian, so they're rejecting the biblical narrative, and that the people of the book were originally commanded to worship God as Hunafa, not as idolaters or polytheists. Hunafa, again, these upright idol worshippers. The people of the book, the Al al Kitab, the people of the book, basically Jews and Christians, and later extended to Sabaeans, hmm, well, Sabians, Zoroastrians, and in India, even idolaters. So these Sabians also recognized as being people of the book, except we know that they're either the Sabaeans, who are Babylonian moon worshippers from Yemen, who are absolutely positively not Christians and not Jews, or they are Sabians, who are Gnostics, heretics, who reject Orthodox Christianity, and therefore at no point can they be people of the book, people of the Bible. They may be mentioned in the Bible as heretics, as people who've gone astray, but certainly they're not Orthodox Christians by any means. And here we've got associations, many associations with Muhammad and his tribe and his religion and these Sabians. And of course, the Zoroastrianism, which they've stolen as well, which we just mentioned from the coins. In Quran 367, Abraham was not a Jew nor a Christian, but he was true in faith and bowed his will to Allah's will, which is Islam, and he joined not gods with Allah. Well, that's interesting. He wasn't a Jew, not a Christian. So if Abraham was the founder of this faith, and he was the faith he practiced prior, according to the biblical sources, the Jewish sources, was this moon paganism of the save of the Sabaeans from Yemen. Well, then they're saying that Abraham was a pagan and that they have adopted paganism, Abraham's paganism. Quran 2, 135, they say, Become Jews or Christians if you want to be guided to salvation. But you, as a Muslim, should say, Nay, I follow the religion of Abraham, the true. He joined not gods with Allah. Well, so the religion of Abraham, again, prior, was paganism. Hanafiya is contrasted with polytheism and the corrupted monotheism of Jews and Christians, and most claim was that Abraham was righteous before Judaism was founded. Now, if Abraham was righteous, then Abraham was a practicing pagan, practicing Babylonian moon worship, because that's the area of the world that he came from. Evidence shows that for a time, Hanafiya was the name used for Muhammad's religion. Well, the Hanafiya, the pagans, again, now we've got direct connection to this paganism, and Abraham was Hanif Muslim. Technically, use of Muslim in Islam started only at the end of 2 AH. Now, I've got here C, Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 3, page 165b, and uh, it's written by Arbel, Introduction to the Quran. However, do note that these terms weren't necessarily widespread at the time. Much later, like roughly the 9th century, you're looking at around the time of the founding of the Sharia, you, what you have is the, the widespread adoption of these terms. But prior to that, it wasn't really called Islam. They weren't really called Muslims. They had different terms. Right. And of course, I'll just call this ha ha nafiya ha ha ha. Yeah. But Muslims have quite literally chosen to call themselves pagans. That's the name that they've taken up for themselves. And the word Hanif in Islamic literature. So Ibn Isham, Ibn Isaq, that's the Sira, occasionally uses Hanif as the equivalent of Muslim. So Pagans, Muslim, pagans, yeah. More frequent is the use of Hanafiya for the religion of Abraham. And again, they insist this is prior to his taking on the worship of Yahweh. The form Tahannuf means the adoption or the practices of Islam or the exercise of the true faith. And the word Tahannuf means penance. So let's see its use in the Sira from Guillaume's Life of Muhammad. Salman the Persian told the apostle that his master in Amuria told him to go to a certain place in Syria where there was a man who lived between two thickets every year. As he used to go from one to the other, the sick used to stand in his way and everyone he prayed for was healed. That's a very Christian idea of the miracles, right? Miracle working healer. The people came to him with their sick and everyone he prayed for was healed. And I said, Allah have mercy on you. Tell me about the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham. He replied, you are asking about something men do not inquire of today. Of course not because this was now defunct, right? This form of Abraham's worship as a pagan, it was defunct. He'd now obviously established this Judaism. And yeah, but of course, Muhammad now wanted to resurrect this original religion. So the time has come near when a prophet will be sent with this religion, this pagan religion from the people of the Haram. 
right? Which is interesting. The haram is the is the sacred space. We'll get to that towards the end, much later. But the word halal is permissible, and haram is not permissible. It's interesting they use the term haram. Go to him, go to Muhammad, for he will bring you to paganism. Yes, he will. And then he went into the thicket. The apostle said to Salman, if you have told me the truth, you have met Jesus, the son of Mary. So now Jesus is this healer that tells Salman to go to Muhammad, who is going to bring the true religion of Abraham. Yeah, Islamic propaganda 101, an Islamic connection to paganism. I'll pause here. We'll pick it up in the next episode. Thanks.